And when I was pretty young, I went to Texas, and then I ended up in Memphis. And I remember I liked that town. It's okay, but it wasn't what I was kind of fantasizing about for the South. And one night I was in this bar, and I heard the DJ talking about this other part of town called Frazier, Tennessee, that he said was the uh, Camaro driving, Copenhagen spitting, <laughs> free bird listening to capital of the world. <laughs> Every, he said, every guy in the old town has a washer and a dryer and an automobile in their yard. <laughs> Your car breaks down in Fraser, Tennessee. The very first guy that you run into can fix your car. <laughs> and then, though, then he's going to kick the shit out of you because you couldn't fix your own car. And in Fraser, Tennessee, that means you're gay. If you can't fix your own car, you sleep with men. And that's an ass whippable offense <laughs> in Fraser, Tennessee. And I remember they, they said, uh, my favorite was, they said they sold more prosthetic limbs and eye patches per capita than anywhere else in the state of Tennessee, in Fraser, Tennessee. And they also, they would talk about this bar that they had there called the Moondogs Tavern. And I remember always thinking that it was like, uh, like the who's that guy that does Lake Wobegon, you know? Um, yeah, I thought it was like that. I thought, uh, <laughs> and then I saw the guy's name was Zeke Logan. He was the DJ, and I saw him one night at this bar called Huey's. I said, "Man, I love that shit you make up about Fraser, Tennessee." He said, "I don't make any of that." <laughs> I said, oh, man, I, thought, I kept thinking in my back of my head, well, maybe I want to go out there, you know. And then one night I was playing at this pool hall called the Highland Q, and after the show I was leaning against this car with my buddy. And this up guy comes up, looks like he worked for the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, you know. <laughs> it, it, it used to, maybe. And then uh, he's got some shoes. He's holding these shoes out. He says, uh, I want you to have my shoes, boy, because you ain't got no goddamn shoes of your own. <laughs> They were too small, you know. But... <laughs> you know what they say. <laughs> they say there's an exception to every rule. That's the way. <laughs> but so <laughs> wait, I've got sidetracked there. Uh, so he he comes up and he, and he says, my name's Moon Dog. I said, oh, you're not that moon dog from the radio, are you? He said, I'm that one. I'm the same guy. I said, man, I, I want to go see your tavern. And he said, well, why don't you, uh, here, I'll give you my phone number, and when you want to come out, you just let me know. And I said, wouldn't it be easier if you just told me how to get there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, I can't tell you how to get there. I can't do that. I, I thought, well, that's funny. You know, that's a funny way of advertising. And <laughs> one night... Oh yeah, it was the 4th of July, me and my buddy Joe, I've been coming up here long enough to level with you, right? We, we can talk, right? So, my buddy Joe and me, we were sitting around the 4th of July and we wanted to smoke pot, but there, there was none anywhere. This is back when I smoked pot. <laughs> like yesterday. Yeah, an hour ago, right? Right as they were saying, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wait, no, wait. But, no, but this, you know, and I, maybe, you know, like, uh, this is back when we did. We, we tried to have some all the time, you know. And so uh, the town was, they say, uh, potheads all say the town's dry. So that was what, the town was dry. And I remember I told Joe, I said, man, remember that nitty gritty dirt band looking guy? If he doesn't have pot, for sure the town's dry. So I had the number still in my pants. I only had a couple pair of pants at the time. I got like four now. This, uh, this, uh, I remember, uh, I, so I called him, and he says, I'll send somebody. So he sends this guy in a Camaro with Freebird coming up. And he puts bandanas around our eyes. I said, I don't know about this, but what else were we going to do, you know? So we get in the car. We got these blindfolds on and we're driving out to Fraser, Tennessee. When he stops the car and takes the blindfolds off, we're in somebody's yard next to the washer and dryer, you know? And 
there's not a commercial district in any way, shape, or form. It's just in this neighborhood. I thought, we're getting rolled. This, these guys have gone the long way to our 23 bucks, you know? <laughs> so, just as I thought, we're, we're about to get beat up now, just, you know, even if we give it to them, they're going to beat us up. So, I was scared, and then just as I was trying to think of a way to run or get out of there, I looked behind this house, that, that lawn that we were in, and uh, there was this tool shed, but it felt like, I mean, you could almost see it, but it felt like it was moving. I, I kept staring at it, and I heard that, hold on loosely, by uh, 38 Special. Do you remember that? <laughs> Another fine Southern group. Uh, I could hear that, and I said, what's that back there? And the guy who drove us says, that's Moondog's Tavern. I said, it's, looks like a tool shed. <laughs> Uh, told me that Moondog, there were seven bars in Fraser, Tennessee, and Moondog had been kicked out of all of them. <laughs> so he built his own. And, uh, and so we went back there, and, uh, you know, he didn't check in with the government about it or anything. <laughs> and people, you know, all he had to do was have his beer be like 10 cents less than everybody else, and it was a hit, you know. So I'm sitting up there, you know, at the bar for a minute, starting to get comfortable. This guy, I mean, there was a guy with an eye patch right in there, you know. <laughs> this is going to be, you know, I was a little nervous, and then Joe kept tapping me, and I, I said, hey, Moondog, we came out here, we wanted to get some, we were, one thought you'd have pie, you know, hippie lettuce, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he says, uh, no, I don't have any of that. And I said, okay, uh, you know, because I don't want to press it, you know. <laughs> he says, I'll, I'll sell you a newspaper, if you'd like to buy a newspaper, we sell those. I said, I don't really read. <laughs> he said, trust me on this. And so uh, I said, okay, I'll take a newspaper, you know. And he hands it over. He goes, that'll be $65. <laughs> we got back in the Camaro and took the rubber band off of that thing. And the news was good. <laughs> something on my mind. 
No, I've been singing this song. I've been singing this song for a long time for a friend of mine named Moondog. He used to have this tavern out in this little town of Fraser, Tennessee. It wasn't really a tavern. It was really a tool shed at his backyard that he served beer at and didn't really check in with the government or anything. But in the bar on like the customer side of the beer was on the customer side of the bar because he didn't have to like to move around so much. And I always sing this song for him, but lately I've been doing it for a friend of mine, a new friend of mine that I met named Digger Dave that I met on tour in Alaska last year. I, I can't remember how long ago it's been, but that was my favorite place to go. Every year I go, I tour, it seems like a lot. And sometimes I get to go someplace different. Alaska was exciting. And it was considerably colder than the Tennessee area. <clears throat> but it's a beach town, which I didn't know. It's right on the water. <laughs> And this was in the dead of winter because, see, the way the, the touring works is, see, it's like a, well, like a, if you're, like a Madonna gets to all the great places, you know, like guys like me would go when it's snowing, that's when I'll come play for you. I ain't afraid to travel. I like to let them motherfuckers come during tourist season anyway, because that way I get to meet the locals and the drunks, you know? So I'm flying into Alaska, right? And I was asleep in the plane. I wake up because the, the guy comes on and goes, OK, Homer Alaska is out to your left. And so I look down to my left. And it looks like a trailer park kind of next to a mall. And it's all Christmas lights. I go, that's the whole damn town? He goes, yeah, that's the town. It's one of the biggest ones in the state. I went, oh, geez. So we get, we land the plane, it's uh, like a 7-Eleven out in the middle of nowhere, covered in snow. I get my guitar and my suitcase and I look out, uh, I look out as I'm walking out, I see there's two taxi cabs parked in the snow. One of the drivers comes in the door. He comes right up to me and goes, hey, you must be the singer. I said, how the hell did you know that, you know? He says, well, there's only 800 people in Homer, Alaska, and there ain't been nobody new in over 10 months. <laughs> We're all real excited to see you. <laughs> he said, you want to ride over to the hotel? <laughs> I said, yeah, I do. So we start walking out over to the, the one of the two cabs, but then the driver from the other cab walks up to the first driver and he goes, hey, man, you know that you're not allowed to go into the airport to pick up a fare, you son of a bitch. And he punches the guy right in the fucking face. And they fall down into the snow and they start rolling around, Alaska style, you know? And I'm standing there with my guitar and my bag and I'm wondering what to do. So I said, uh, well, look, I'm gonna, I kind of try to say it calmly, like well, the first guy, that's the guy I'm going with. But they just finished anyway. So then when they got done, uh, they get up and I get in the cab with the first guy. It's a true story. So he turns around to me, he says, hey, did you see that some bitch hit me right in the face? You can't, you know, just hit people in the face. Some bitch hit me in the face. I, you know what, I gotta call the police. Is what I, I gotta call the police. I said, you should call the police. He had a cell phone. So I pick up the cell phone, he dialed 911. A little time goes by, so it seems like somebody up to something. He goes, hey, John, listen, yeah. Hey, this is Craig. Jeff just hit me right out in front of the fucking airport. <laughs> The singer saw the whole damn thing. <laughs> and then I goes, <clears throat> oh, so the singer made it in okay? <laughs> so he takes me over to the, the hotel there and the promoter, the guy that comes and tries to get me to come to town, he, uh, he comes over and goes, oh, I was gonna give you a tour. So they drove me around. I got to see the fir first time I drove around, I seen a moose. I seen a bunch of eagles, and I was down on the edge of the coastline there, but the water's kind of iced, kind of, and you can hear it slushing around, and the sand has got mostly snow on it, except for some of it, you know, there's nowhere to lay out or anything. And I saw down at the end of the uh, cove there was a, uh, there was like a, this house, but it seemed, it seemed like there was about 18 of these little houses in a cluster where one would be like a, a, tr like a half a trailer duct taped to some tent with some driftwood. <laughs> and there was a bunch of these little houses kind of circled amongst themselves and there was uh, smoke coming out. So I said to the promoter, I said, who, who lives over there, you know? And let's go over there. He goes, no, let's not go over there. I said, why can't we go over there? He goes, 
I don't want to. I said, what's the problem? He says, you know, it's a small town, but we, we got a tough side of town too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, all right. So he drives me back to the hotel and I walk, I got a coat and then I walk back over there and I went to the biggest house and I knocked on the door and this guy opens the door. He's got this big beard out past the shoulders and the hair going everywhere. And uh, uh, he says, oh, holy shit, it's the singer. <laughs> And he's, uh, he's got all these people behind him, and they got beards too, you know, and they're all sitting around in a little circle playing guitar and singing John Prine songs, and they got chicks, you know, and they got thinner beards than the dudes. So I sit down with these guys, and I start playing some songs for a while, and we were having a good time, and I remembered I gotta go back and play my show. So I said, well, I gotta go take a nap or something. So this guy, the first guy that opened the door, his name, that was Digger Dave, and he had introduced himself. So when I got done, that was the only guy's name I remember because of the Digger at the front of it. And I said, hey, Digger Dave, why don't you come see me sing tonight down at the Armor? And he said, I can't go do that. And all his friends started laughing at me. I said, what did I say so funny? And they said, well, there's only 10 bars in Homer, Alaska, and Digger Dave ain't been allowed any of them in over 15 years. <laughs> And then all everybody was like, well, neither of us really, you know, a good, a good bunch of us. So I said, I'll try to hook it up so that you can go. So I called the owner of the club. He says, I got to call the mayor. The mayor says, I got to cover whatever this guy breaks. And then they say he can come. So I go down to this show, and there's not a lot of people, and they're not really paying attention, which thank you for paying attention, by the way, tonight. <laughs> And they clap a little bit at the end of the songs, but not a ton, you know? And then the door opens, and here comes Digger Dave and his group of guys, you know? It's like the Manson family aging, you know? And they come in, and it's a standing fucking ovation for these guys. And the next day on the radio, they said, uh, you should have seen the show down at the Army last night. It was fantastic. And then the guy never mentioned me. He never said anything about the music. He said, they let Digger Dave in. <laughs> so apparently he knows the singer. <laughs> anyway, to make a short story long, this is what I'm wrapping it up to. At the very end of it, this guy, uh, we were back at his house. And uh, uh, he says, uh, hey, man, you played a song tonight that felt like it changed my life. I said, what was it? He said, what was that song you did about the guy who got thrown out of so many bars that he finally built one in his own backyard? I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I said, that was Moon Dogs Tavern. Well, that's where I'm going to go. about that song you played for Moondog and you fucking hated it. <laughs> but when you hear why though, when uh, he said, I played it for him and he said, first off, it's a little derivative, but <laughs> second, it's pretty sure. And you talk about me and all the people you've met out here, you mentioned nobody but me. And um, his wife introduced herself to people as Moon Bitch. And that was the first one. <laughs> he said, that should have been in there. <laughs> And there was this uh, guy that, uh, this air conditioner repair guy that would like bur uh, burn, could, could hold a, a candle up to his hand for like a fucking hour, which is like, they should have charged the cover for that. And <coughs> he thought, he said, that guy should have been in there. <laughs> I met Jesus once. There. The news was good, as I said. <laughs> 
this, uh, this, uh, I got a but I can't prove it, but I got this Vietnam veteran friend that was with me. They, everybody trusts those guys, right? So, it's my buddy Mark Marchetti. We wrote a song uh, together. I'm not sure which one it was, but I know that we wrote one together. <laughs> And he, w he was saying, take me out to that place, because after I went, I loved everybody out there, even the people that threatened to beat me up, I thought were cool. And I go out there all, and went out there every, all the time. I became their house singer, you know. I would, maybe most days it was just me and Moondog sitting at the bar. I'd be singing to him, and uh, not be it, waiting for everybody to get off work, you know. And uh, anyway, I, my buddy Mark, I told him I'd take him out there drive him out, take off the blindfold, we come in. <laughs> there's this guy, uh, there's what, you know, I gotta, there's some rules. I gotta, uh, so I bring him in, oh, no joke, because we walk in, Moondog is watching wrestling at the one end of the bar, and at the other end of the bar, this guy that really honestly looks like the pictures you see of Jesus, his beard, big brown hair, beard, big, thick, bushy, long down, his clothes were a lot newer, but he had these, uh, stick, like, on his shins and his knees, it was like uh, scratches and cuts, like he'd been running from somebody or something, you know? It was pretty fresh looking cuts, too. And uh, nobody believes me when I tell him this, but honest to God, the guy had a fucking uh, harpsichord, too. <laughs> How could you make that up? He's playing this thing, might be in tune or not. I don't know if it's in tune or not, but whatever, you know, he's not playing it like it's in tune. And he's going, la, ba, da. And my buddy and me said, we should sit at the other end of the bar. So we go down, we go down to the other end of the bar and we're uh, sitting there for a while. And uh, no joke, the guy looks up at my buddy after a few minutes, he says, man, you don't need to be sorry about anything we did over there. You don't need to feel bad about yourself. And my buddy Mark goes, what? He says, you know what I'm talking about. We shouldn't feel bad. That's old fat guys with cigars and unpublished phone numbers that should feel bad about what happened over there, not me and you. And we got, you know, I got, it's like X-Files, you know? <laughs> I got goosebumps on my arms and, and uh, God, I'm just getting, I'm thinking about it. But, uh, and my buddy Mark goes, have we said shit to this guy? <laughs> I said, we haven't said nothing. He says, what do you mean over there? He says, Vietnam, over there. He says, man were you over there? And the guy has in his pocket his draft notice. Says, damn right I was over there. And me and my buddy, we thought, this is beautiful. You know, but we, uh, we thought we should also get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Today's not really the day to check out the tavern or come back tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember we were, I guess, you know, we're driving back out, and, and he turns to me, and he, I guess he was in shock. He goes, man, I just want to make sure of something. Did, did you see that guy, too? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, I think it was Jesus. <laughs> he said I wasn't going to say nothing, but I thought the same thing. So we called, when we got home, we called... Uh, <laughs> We called Moon on We said, hey, we think that guy was Jesus. He said, man, that's the best shit I've heard all day because after you left, I went in to take a leak and Jesus took $144 out of the till. <laughs> he said, I thought, I thought he was going to spend it on drugs. It's nice to know that now it's going to be going to people that need it. <laughs> anyway, what made me tell you all that is this song, I got... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, come up with this uh, at the bar one after day, one trying to trying to redeem the one that he didn't like. This is a song that was supposed to be about some of the people that, you know, might have needed it. Uh, it starts like a country one and goes. thing rolling up a hose outside in the rain he's been my neighbor since say 79 of course he was in prison most of that time <laughs> ever since then he's ain't been right 
those old lady works days and they fight most nights. Laid off and blown off, pissed off on booze. Double wide blue. Metallica song blasting from three trailers down. Some cut off t shirt and nunchuck kids coming around. Tonight they're gonna get drunk and try to get laid and they're gonna end up beating the hell out of each other behind the same arcade. You know, one of those little shits broke my window last spring. I told his mama she didn't do anything. She works two jobs, boy runs loose. Double wide, double wide. My buddy Jimmy, man, his trailer school. He's got him a deck with one of those blue plastic pools. He works in construction, builds spec homes. His woman left him though, so now he's down there alone. My friend Anita loves him and he don't even know. So busy chasing my neighbor's wife, Flo. So Barbara heaven with out all the clues. Double wide blue, double wide blue. I got the blue, double wide. Wild Bill, the manager, man, he keeps to himself. War took his smile like them pills took his hell. He's too old to run around with the plan anymore, but he's still got a U.S. flag hanging up outside of his door. I sit here watching all of this nothing go on. I don't get out much since O.J. spit on. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of nice not having nothing to lose, except these double wide blue, double wide blue. I got the blue, blue double white, the double white, blue, blue, I got the blue, blue the double Because um, I got so many, I wrote uh, so many songs out there. I know it. And this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I earned every one of them. This, um, you know, there's a sad part to almost all the stories there are, you know, probably, but that, it, not necessarily. And my, the, so Moondog's not alive anymore. Uh, he, w he wasn't really afraid of it. He got sick, and we all knew that he was going to get sick, and he didn't care. He was always joking about it. He said that it was nature's way of paying for his doctor's car. <laughs> right? <laughs> and we had this uh, funeral. It was the best, I swear, it was better than any wedding I'd ever been to. Uh, man, everybody was there. It was outside. Everybody brought a cooler. That guy that could hold the candle to his hand was there. He didn't do it, but I mean, he was there. They, uh, Jesus wasn't there. Oh, nobody could prove he was there. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, I was, yeah, I would bet, you know. Uh, um, uh, Ah, it was. I remember though it was just so fun, and there was everybody was drinking and they were playing music, and and there was uh, 
the whole crew seemed like they were there. I remember Moondog's sister's son and one of his buddies pulled this uh, little mullet-headed fuckers and they, uh, <laughs> I remember they were pulling this bird apart behind a park van. <laughs> Different culture than mine. <laughs> and, but then we, um, then she played the music. She, she got up, she said, Moondog was philosophically opposed to having things, so he only left us some songs he wanted us to hear. And so he puts on the first song is Please Don't Bury Me, My John Prine. And, uh, yeah, and we're all clapping and singing. And then he plays this song called Big Key Sides. And then the last song he, had, song he had played at his funeral was the song he said he hated, which was Moondog's Town. And we all sang that. That made me feel a little better. And then uh, we had the uh, motorcade where everybody, everybody that had lights at work turned them on and we <laughs> drove to the bar. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember uh, a guy got pulled over, too. <laughs> Which was like our version of having, you know, police escort, I guess. <laughs> so we got over to the bar, and uh, we were all having a good time. And I didn't tell you before, we were making a, the same record that I was talking about on the last, uh, just a minute ago, that Viva Satellite record. We were making that at the time. We were supposed to be working all day in the studio, and we had asked for a half day off to go to this funeral. And way more than a half day had gone by, and <laughs> the rest of the day was pretty off, you know? <laughs> 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 We were in his bedroom, I remember me and his son were writing these notes to him. It started off like, we're gonna miss you, and by the end it was like, you owe me 20 bucks, you fucking ass. <laughs> and then the guitar player comes in, he says, man, we're supposed to go to the studio. So we thought, well, we'll let's take everybody with us. And so we take the, the entourage, funeral possession, uh, back out on the road and down to the Arden Studios in Memphis and piled everybody in. And we did, this is the song we did, this is the, only song I ever recorded in a tie, and it uh, goes out to Michael Moondog Webb, Wreck of Honor, and King of Fred. <laughs> this song I come up with in between some town, some place, and I was, I was remember when I used to be a busboy at this place called Peppers, and I used to bitch all the time. I go, man, this sucks, God, this sucks. This is the worst thing they could ever, if I could just have a band, man, everything would be good. And then I got a band, and I bitched just as much. <laughs> so one day, and I had this girl that I had dated for just a little while, and she said, boy, you're cute, but when you bitch, it is just so unattractive. <laughs> so one day I decided, I said, I'm a lucky, I'm a lucky son of a bitch. I got a great bunch of guys to drive around with and play, and I shouldn't complain so much. No, I don't. <laughs> and, and anyway, so I come up with this song about guy who was a busboy and ended up being in a band. I gotta warn you though, by the time I made it all rhyme and everything, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's, <laughs> it's really just this uh, hodgepodge of bullshit, but Joe has such a good bass part that we play it anyway. in space racing the moon climbing the walls of a hurricane still overall I guess I can't complain all I wanted was a one chance to let freedom ring said I had to get a permit tags and everything I never made it through the red tape I got a paper hat I got a job working weekdays You want fries with that I got nothing to lose Cause there's nothing to gain It's like a one-way ticket to cruise in that passing lane I can't complain
I was talking to my girlfriend. I told her I was stressed. I said I'm going off the deep end. She said, give it a rest. We're all waiting in the dugout, wishing we could pitch. How you gonna throw a shut out? If all you do is bitch, I got nothing to lose. You know I won't get caught. I'm gonna make one last stand. You know I can't be bought. Then again, on the other hand, how much have you got? I got nothing to lose. Cause there's nothing to gain. It's like a one way ticket to cruise in that passing lane. I can't complain A little out of place A little out of tune Sort of lost in space Racing the moon Climbing the walls Of a hurricane Still over all I I know I can't complain Can't get their hands under that 
Fortunately, I have the key to escape reality. And you may see me tonight with an illegal smile. It don't cost very much, but it lasts a long while. Won't you please tell the man I didn't kill anyone. No, I was just trying to have me some fun. Thank you very much. That's a John Prine song called Illegal Smile. I did it for that pretty lady that came up here and offered me a glass of that uh, whiskey. I'd already had a little of it before, so I responsibly declined. Told her that if she had a shot of it, I would play her that song. And I figured that a verse and a chorus is enough because she just had a shot of whiskey and she won't know the difference. I have this new song that I want to try on you. But before, and I might have, if you were here last night, you might have heard this before, but if you weren't, have you ever, and this will take just a second and we'll get back to all the other stuff. Let, uh, but just let me just try this on you. You ever heard that song, uh, If Tomorrow Never Comes, right? Garth Brooks. I like that song, Sensitive Peace. He follows that by says, Will she know how much I love her? All right, so listen, check this out. 
this song that I'm about to play for you was inspired by the time that I got to meet the guy that was one of the five guys that came up with the song, If Tomorrow Never Comes. Wish you know how much I love her. But before I can make that make sense, I got to back up to when I got a song that I came up with. I played it earlier. B double E double R U N B R. Okay, so maybe that's not as sensitive of a piece. As if tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I love her? But I think it is uh, as sensitive enough. Okay. That's irrelevant, sort of. I'm sitting around in my house. I'm watching the uh, baseball package. I got the baseball yeah. package. Go White Sox. Yeah, I got a lot of teams I like. I'm watching some of the teams I like play baseball. And my manager calls me on the phone, which I, tr I pick up almost every time when he calls. And I said, hey, man, what's up? He said, I got some bad news. I said, what? He says, you know your song, B double E double R U M B run? I said, yeah. He goes, well, you know you played that at that festival a few months ago. I said, yeah. He goes, well, listen, there's another version of it on the radio, and it's not yours. And like 99 guys wrote it, and it goes almost exactly like yours goes, but it's not exactly like yours, and I think they stole it from you. And I thought, oh, I don't have to come into fucking town for this, do I, man? <laughs> And as God is my witness, brothers and sisters, I did not give a fuck. I, uh, I, I already told you I had the baseball package. What else am I going to do? Right? I said, I seriously, make it go away. He said, you're the easiest guy I've ever worked with. <laughs> then he comes back a couple months later and he says, uh, uh, it's towards the end of the summer now, and he says, uh, Hey, I got ba badder news. These guys, they say now that you took it from them. That's different. And I didn't care. And I didn't even care if it was on my record, man. I was like, take it off our album, whatever. I, as long as there's no meetings, I don't have to get dressed up, come to town, meet with nobody. I don't give a rat's ass about hardly anything. So this should be easy. So then, check this out. So he calls me back and says, we went into court, seems like nobody took no oath, nothing from nobody, and everybody can go about their way, which is what I thought should happen to begin with. And, uh, and, and then uh, I got, I'm living in Nashville, right? So like twice a week we induct somebody into some shit. <laughs> and they had found something that they hadn't given, they hadn't put Tom T. Hall in yet. So. They just, they were going to do, the, and he should be in all the stuff that they have. Uh, so, so they said, hey, let's put him in this other thing. So they called me up and said, would you sing a song uh, at this, which I was excited to do. I got dressed up. I wore this. I went, I sang, I rehearsed the song. I sang it. It was a great time. And then in the back dressing room, just like almost all these clubs have a dressing room. And in it, there's like celery and carrots and broccoli sprigs and some ranch dressing to put it in and some towels and free beer and all this free shit that really makes the musician life add up for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking with you. I factor the free ranch dip into, into the, my joy. I do. I, I fucking do. And I'm unapologetic about it. So I'm sitting back in the free celery and free alcohol area with Peter Cooper, who's here tonight. And he says to me, he says to me, you see that guy over there? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you know that song? If tomorrow never comes, wish you know how much I said, God, I love that song. It's kick ass. He says, that guy over there by the celery wrote it. So we, mo I said, well, let's go over and talk to him. So we come over with our free drinks in hand. If tomorrow never come. Woo! <laughs> and uh, uh, the guy says, oh, yeah, thank you. You know my song. Yeah, we know your song, man. And, uh, uh, he's, and we were, you know, free drinks and everything. <laughs> and he says to me, though, he says, well, no. So I say to him, hey, man. I'm Todd Snyder, it's nice to meet you. And he knew my name. He went, Todd Snyder, I know you. And I said, yeah. He goes, I had a lot of trouble with you last summer. 
And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you know that song, Beer Run? I said, yeah. He said, well, I wrote it too. <laughs> right? And in my mind, I'm thinking, you took it from me, man. So I said to him, you took it from me. And he said, as God is my witness, not technically. I thought it was clever. And he went on to explain to me the rules of how you can take a certain amount of words and combine them with a certain amount of notes. And if you go too far, you're stealing. And if you're not, you're not. And I thought, this guy's clever. God damn. And as he was, here's the crux of the whole event. As he was walking away, I got this cool idea for a song that I wrote <laughs> all by myself. It's called If Tomorrow Never Comes. If tomorrow never comes, I won't give a damn. If tomorrow never comes, I will not be afraid to meet my maker just the way that I am. You can't prove anything, but one thing is true. If you can steal from me, I can steal from you. Any kind of heaven everybody doesn't get him won't seem like heaven to me. They tell you that the Garden of Eden was perfect, but you couldn't even eat off the apple tree. And for heaven's sake, look out for that snake lying to you, woman, constantly. Adam must have scratched his head, looked up and said, Love, mm, this ain't doing it for me. Tomorrow never come. I don't give a damn. If tomorrow never comes, I don't want to be afraid to meet my maker just the way I am. Can't do anything I'm dying to. If tomorrow never comes tonight, I'll have to do. I said, I don't ever claim to know what's going on around here. I don't even know where I'm from. I know where I'm going when I get to where I'm going, what I'm doing when I get done. Tell me I'm forgiven if I need to be. Say permission not to come that easily. Piling cores up underneath this apple tree. I'm singing, oh Lord, have mercy on me if tomorrow never comes. And tonight is all I got. If tomorrow never comes, I don't want to be afraid to come and meet you just the way that I'm not. Can't do anything and then you die. Judge the judgmental lamb, what am I? Judge the judgmental lamb, what am I? Judge the judgmental lamb, what am I? Either way, I'm every guy that I ever tried not to be. I want everything as good as it gets. I've learned nothing but that there's another sunrise coming, all but one of the times it sets. And if tomorrow never comes, tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow never comes If we were all good people We could work in perfect rhythm If worms had daggers Birds wouldn't fuck with them This guy took my beer on song from me And so sometimes people get mistaken And they think that this song is supposed to be About the guy that took the song beer run from me And it's not really I Just except for I took his title from him Just to make it even but it wasn't uh, to make a point about him. I was already trying to talk about this other thing that I was working on with some notes for a few months. And it wasn't until I ran into him that I had my title. But before that, I was working on all this shit about the... Uh, I grew up in a Catholic church of an altar boy. That wasn't a surprise to me. I still like that stuff. And, uh, I was, I'm kind of an old the Bible a little bit, but some of it, like, one, this song was supposed to be about, there's one part of the Bible that I find confusing, which is, okay, you take seven days to put everything together, right, okay, I'm down with that. Then, the uh, first day, there's that guy, his name's Adam, he's standing there by himself, there's one guy on the planet. Then, God makes a chick for him. Now, there's two people on the planet, and then they have two kids. Their names are Cain and Abel. That's four people on the planet. Then Cain kills Abel. Now we got three people on the planet. Well, that's everybody, right? Roll call. Three people. Then Dad says to uh, Cain, you got to get out of here. We're banishing you from the friggin' kingdom. You got to walk around. So he walks around. He comes back a few years later with a chick and kids. So this song's not about somebody stealing nothing from me. This song's about that chick. Where'd that chick come from? And why is everybody has 
Y'all got, I know it's Saturday, but you got one more story? Can I tell you one more story before we I got, uh, I got this friend of mine named uh, Mark Marchetti. He lived uh, in Memphis when I met him. He uh, writes a lot of songs for different people and uh, writes a lot of poems. And uh, we just became very close after a lot of, uh, after a while, you know, and that's been about 10 years ago. And now if I say like, you know, everybody's got that friend that they talk to all the time. This is my friend that I like talk to like five times a week. I'll talk to Mark. They call him Hoot all the time. I don't know how I got that nickname, but. Anyway, after about five years of him, when he would call, he, he stopped saying, like some people would do, like he'd stop saying that it was Mark. He would say, uh, uh, Todd Snyder, yeah, this is the police department, and uh, <laughs> we gotta, and I oh, bought it a lot, you know. Well, he said he was my manager once, and he canceled all these shows, you know. And sometimes I would catch him, you know, but he would get me a lot. And then one time last Christmas, I was uh, just doing nothing, and the telephone rang, and I picked it up. But hello? And he says, yeah, is this Todd Snyder? I says, yeah. He says, so this is Garth Brooks. I'm calling you from out in California. And I went, oh, okay, Garth Brooks. You know, I figured, here we go again. I was like, well, okay, whatever you need, Garth. You just fire away whenever you're ready. Shoot. What can I help you with? And, uh... He starts talking for a while, you know, and my friend, I don't know if you've ever seen Garth Brooks on, I bet you everybody's seen Garth Brooks on TV at least once or twice, and when they ask him questions, he's always so humble, you know, and my friend Mark, he's not humble at all. So <laughs> after about five minutes of this humility routine, I start going, I don't think this is my friend Mark, you know. <laughs> so I start listening closer, and it starts to sound like it might be Garth Brooks. <laughs> So I interrupt him, I, I had to interrupt him. I say, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but is this really Garth Brooks? He says, yeah, I'm calling you from out in California. And I thought, I said to him, I says, uh, could you repeat all that shit that you said just before? Because I wasn't paying any attention. I was trying to figure out who the fuck it was, you know? It gets weirder too, because he started over. He says, he goes, uh, this is true. In fact, almost everything I told you tonight is true. That he, uh, <laughs> he starts talking about this idea for an album. He's yeah, and I'm like, I'm on the phone with Garth Brooks. And uh, he said, I got this idea for an album. Uh, I'm working on it right now. It's this guy named Chris Gaines. And I said, oh, who's Chris Gaines? He said, well, I'm Chris Gaines. Garth Brooks isn't Chris Gaines, but I'm Chris Gaines. And Chris Gaines isn't Garth Brooks, but... I mean, you know, I'm Garth Brooks, but I'm also Chris Gaines, but I'm not. Garth Brooks isn't Chris Gaines. And I started to get dizzy on the phone. And he was telling about this rock and roll singer. I don't know if you saw him later that year on TV. He had a big black wig on, and he was uh, portraying this person, this Chris Gaines person. And I thought, what a fucking lunatic, you know? I'm on the phone. <laughs> but I wanted to be supportive. <laughs> So I told him I thought it was a great idea, you know. <laughs> and he gave to the party, he says, uh, this was the catch of the conversation. He goes, you've got a song called All Right Guy. And uh, yeah. right on, right on. he says, I, I think that I want this Chris Gaines guy to sing uh, All Right Guy on his album too, you know. And my first thought was, well, what kind of car am I trading that fucking van in for? <laughs> <laughs> and my next thought was, hey, this is the greatest idea that I have ever heard. I was extremely supportive after that. Then we got off the phone and uh, I, I called around to some friends to see if, you know, it turned out that it was true, you know. You have no way of knowing. So I called around and said, I think that really was him. Even at the end, we, we didn't know. And then uh, two weeks or three weeks go by and he calls to have my old friend Garth calls me again, you know. <laughs> he says, uh, I didn't know if you were off the road or uh, on the road, but we're going to record your song tonight. And we figure you probably know it pretty good. You could show it to us. 
and I do know it pretty good, so I have my guitar and all that, and I put it in the car, and I start driving out to this mansion that they had given me directions to, like way out in the country in Nashville. I'm driving around lost, like earlier in the set, and I, <laughs> I finally get to this big-ass mansion. I knock on the door. I swear, y'all, open the door. It's Garth Brooks standing, like, right, just, like, from television, standing right in front of me. Or Chris Gaines, whichever fucking one, but... <laughs> Both good singers, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Shitty baseball players. Yeah! <laughs> anyway, so uh, we get there, and I get out my stuff, and they put me in this little booth, and we start doing the All Right Guy song. And, uh, he, and he's singing. I'm watching him through the glass sing this song. And uh, I don't know if some of you might have heard it. If you haven't heard it, there's a line in there that says... Uh, I know I'm dirty and I know I smoke a little dope, you know? Yeah. And I was looking through this glass and when I saw him say that, I thought, oh no. <laughs> uh, this is never gonna happen. So I went home and I told my wife and we took back a bunch of different appliances and stuff like that. that we had <laughs> And then like a, a few, like a month or two goes by and I get this call from him again. He says, man, I got some terrible news. I said, I've kind of been expecting it, you know. So my record company, they don't think I should say I smoke pot right in front of everybody like that. And I, so that's, that's what my record company said to me. <laughs> two packs paths diverged in the woods. <laughs> so, uh, so we do, uh, you know, so uh, he says, he goes, so here's the catch though, I got, a, I got a, another record I'm supposed to make next year under the name Garth Brooks, and I thought like, if you don't mind, if I can find a word that rhymes with dope that's not dope, what if I ch change it? I said, change it. And he said, well, no, I'll think about it for a while. So I thought about it, and I went over to, like, I talked to a bunch of my friends and different guitar players, and they go, don't sell out. You don't, and I go, fuck you, you know? <laughs> I told him he could do whatever he wanted to. He could make a Christmas carol out of it for a while. <laughs> Making sure he get my address right. <laughs> So keep your fingers crossed for me. Maybe uh, you'll come up with a word that rhymes with dope. Next time I come to town, I'll buy drinks for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I had a, last time I was here, if I'm not mistaken, I told you I was gonna get uh, that uh, Garth Brooks had called me and he said he was gonna record this song I made up called All Right Guy. And uh, I was shocked to hear that he was gonna record it, but I got excited. I don't know if you remember me telling you the whole story. It was all drawn out. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, an exciting moment there. And then, uh, and then uh, they decided they weren't gonna do the song because it said that I uh, smoked grass. Since I smoke pot or dope or something in the lyric, it's hard for me to remember all the lyrics with the new f fuzzy math going around. <laughs> but uh, he, he said he wasn't gonna do it and then uh, that was semi-disappointing. And then, uh, but if you remember, I also I said that he said he might do it at some later date. So there was always sort of hanging there in the balance. And we were hoping because uh, we'd been having some Gar trouble and things of that nature. And if Garth Brooks would just sort of help us out, we would appreciate it. <laughs> but it, it, uh, then on the other hand, uh, I got home and I heard, I guess it was a rumor to begin with, but someone said, oh, well, he, now he's thinking about doing it again. You know, he's going to put it on his next record. And by that time, I thought, oh, I don't want him to do it because I... I just got home from driving around the country telling everybody that he was thinking about doing it, but he decided not to do it. And if he did change his mind and decide to do it, I was going to come back to town and buy drinks for everybody. <laughs> so fortunately for me, he decided once again not to do it. I'm kind of lucky like that. You know, just the other morning I was hanging around in my house. 
I had that new book with all them pictures of Madonna in it. I was checking it out. Just then a friend of mine came through the door. She said she'd never picked me for a scumbag before. She said she didn't ever want to see me anymore. And I still don't know why. I think I'm an alright guy. Tonight's my friend Michelle's birthday, so we're probably gonna force her to smoke some dough. That one particular line in the song has, has really cost me in my life. <laughs> First, when we put it on a record, we made a video and we wanted to play it on VH1. I know I'm dirty, I know I smoke a lot of dough. I can play that on VH1. And I swear to God, you won't believe me if I tell you this, but I'll tell you this, I swear to God, Garth Brooks recorded this song. I have a tape of him doing it. And he was gonna put it on his album. I know I'm dirty and I know I smoke a lot of dope. He couldn't say that. He said, couldn't you rhyme anything else? with Pope. And then some other country guy did it. Same reason though, they wouldn't do it. All these different times I would buy these minor appliances and have to take them back. <laughs> and then uh, Jerry Jeff Walker, he just did it. He just did it. And it's on his new uh, record. Which is my favorite person to ever sing you know and his way of solving and he said you know sometimes and I mean only for medicinal purposes but you know they made me smoke some dope <laughs> I guess that blows any chances I have of ever becoming the president of the Pope outside of uh, this particular bar. Cop pulled me over, he said, hey, uh, old timer, we're gonna have to get you to step out of the car. I was only kidding when I called him a young fucking dick. Still he made me do the stupid human tricks. Now I'm stuck in this jail with a bunch of dumb hicks and I still don't know why. Just won't live until I gotta die. I know I ain't perfect, but I know I try. I think I'm an alright guy. I think I'm alright. Yeah, I think I'm an alright guy. I think I'm
have to mean it. If you're drunk, it'll feel good anyway. Say, thank God. Listen, I want to thank you all for being so nice to us tonight. And I want to thank my buddy, Will Kimbrough. Not just for that great set he played opening the show, but for how much he made of the show tonight, helping me out with the guitar. One of the most talented people in the world. As God is my witness, and uh, if you get a chance, go get his record tonight. You could get one of mine, but it's all the same shit. Get his. And I want to remind you again, I know I've already said this, but it's important to me to say this again because Louisville, I drive through Louisville all the time, and I've always wanted to find a club to play here finally got one. So promise me, promise me you're going to tip the bartender like you don't usually tip the bartender. If you got a waitress, tip the waitress like you don't normally tip the waitress. If there's a bouncer, thank him for bouncing. You know what I'm saying? I want him to say, hey, that Snyder was all right and so was his crowd. And then in about six years, we'll come back here and trash this fucking place. How many people are you going to college? Isn't there it's supposed to be a college close to here? No? Doesn't sound like it. Why is it when you ask a guy about his college, he has to use his voice? UT! Why can't you go UT? <laughs> hey, you say it however you fucking want to. You paid the money to get in, you do whatever you fucking want. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. This ain't the fastest show. I'm not a folk Nazi and I'm not gonna demand that you listen to me, okay? In fact, I remember one time when I was a senior in high school, that's where you're supposed to be planning your future. And they uh, came over the intercom and they said, oh yeah, Mrs. Jackson, we'd like to have Todd Snyder down to the principal's office if we could. And the whole class went, Ooh, like they do. And it was nothing new to me. I've been suspended from the school a few times. They said, hey, we need to talk about your future. Are you planning on going to college? I said, you mean more school? They said, yeah. I said, on purpose? They said, yeah. I said, you know, man, I know this may sound a little nuts, but I was kind of thinking maybe I could be a folk singer. And my high school counselor said, we need to be serious and talk about real jobs. I said, I'm being serious. He said, you know, folk singers have to travel a lot and they don't really make a lot of money. I said, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to do. He said, I'm calling your mom. So he called my mom. And they said, you go home for the day. So I went home for the day and there was my mom sitting in the driveway tapping her foot, you know. She said, wait till your fucking father gets home with this folk singer bullshit. She said, I'll tell you one thing right now. You're never going to make any money making any music. And I'll tell you something else right now. I used to go out with one of those guys in Paul Revere and the Raiders. And they may look good under the good lights and everything. But those are some of the ugliest motherfuckers you ever saw. And they haven't seen sunlight in like seven years. 
and all they do is sit around and smoke cigarettes until they drink coffee, and then they drink coffee till they smoke whiskey, and then they smoke pot until they start drinking some other kind of alcohol, and then they go out there and they play the same shit they played last night. I said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. My dad came home and he said, hey, no way, no way. Not any son of mine, not in front of my friends. You're gonna go to college and you're gonna get a real job. I said, who's gonna pay for the college? It's a long silence. Sometimes, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I do this, I used to do this more than 200 nights a year. Thanks to all of y'all, I've been getting to do it a little bit less for my back and stuff. <laughs> Thanks to a lot of y'all, I've been able to not have to drive so much and I get to fly more and that helps my back. Thanks to some of y'all bringing me flowers and not drugs, that helps not my back, but supposedly it makes me feel better or something. I achieve my goals or some shit. And some nights, man, I gotta tell you the truth. I gotta tell you, Louisville, like you'd be, like me and Will, we both know this. In fact, he played this town naked one time. He hated it so much. You go down to Oxford, Mississippi, you know? And I'm sure it's a good school. And I know their track team is in town, but I fucking hate playing there. All these rich white kids in khaki pants with white shirts and some sort of ball cap on, and they don't clap in between the songs. And you wanna say, hey, when you pay your own fucking rent someday, you might clap every once in a while. But you don't say that, because you're just a singer. So you go back into your closet, little dressing room. Maybe somebody left a joint in there, and you smoke it, and you go, well, it's just Oxford, you know, fuck it. And you drive away as fast as you can. And some nights when that happens, you know, we get back in the van, and the tape player doesn't work, and it's like, I love J.J. Kale, but we've heard it 56 times, and we can't get it out of the cassette player. And uh, we got to do something about that. And the air conditioner's not working. And the drummer wants to smoke. And it's driving you crazy because the windows won't come open. And every once in a while, I think to myself, I think, you know what? Maybe my mom was right. I think maybe my high school counselor was right. I think, you know, maybe even my dad was right. Most importantly, I think, maybe I was wrong. And every once in a while, you have a night out on the road where you feel like that. And every once in a while, though, you come to a town like this particular one we're in tonight. You walk into a club called the Headliners. The owner treats you like you're a human being. The waitresses are nice to you. They got a box of beer for you on ice. They got a towel back there for you. They got some cute girl coming back asking you if you need anything. There's a big crowd and they seem to be letting you do whatever you want. And every once in a while, I mean just every once in a while, I'm talking every once in a while, every little once in a while, I want to say, look at me now, mama, motherfucker, I'm a folk singer. 